Imagine for a second that you're an early European sailor looking for a sandy island reported by pirates when, in the distance, you see a small island with upright projections. As you approach the island, you realize that these small projections are actually massive stone statues and that there are other humans on the island. Well, this is what happened to Jacob Rogabine, a Dutch sailor, hundreds of years ago in 1722. The island he landed upon was Rapid Nui, which he later called Easter Island because he landed on the island on Easter Sunday. It was later learned that the island's inhabitants were Polynesians who discovered the island in the 13th century, and that the stone statues were called Moai. Now, you might be asking yourself, Yeah, it's great. Tell stories about the past, but who gives a crap? Those people are dead. But the answer is, you should care. Because these Moai actually tell a pretty interesting story that can actually help shape the future. What we want to think about is how do we use that knowledge that we can generate from the past, from the archaeological record, and use it to, to shape our future. The Polynesians of Rapa Nui were able to successfully persist for 500 years on an isolated island with very limited resources. Rapa Nui is 4,000 kilometers away from the Chilean mainland and therefore very isolated and lacks tropical conditions to allow for the great biodiversity and great farming conditions found on other Polynesian islands like Hawaii. Instead, the island was pretty dry and the only plant that grew consistently was sweet potatoes. So, with limited resources of food and water on the island, and the inability to import these goods from neighboring islands, how were the early Polynesians of Rapa Nui able to persist for so long? Well, the answer is in Moai. The Moai of Rapa Nui measured 3 meters in height and up to 70 tons in weight. Obviously, creating these statues was not a one-man job. The creation of Moai required cooperation between a considerable number of individuals. Not only is creating one Moai a feat in itself due to its size, but imagine the cooperation it took to make the 1,000 Moai found on Rapa Nui. Now, you might be wondering, how is cooperation favored over competition on an island where resources were so limited? Well, on an island with finite resources, competition was inevitable. However, the people of Rapa Nui found a way to compete that did not involve destructive behavior. Instead, they participated in costly signaling, which is a way of signaling resources that individuals and communities have in order to avoid direct conflict. Investment in statues essentially explained as investment that individuals make in terms of their community to demonstrate their resources as an individual to the community, as well as a signal that's being sent from communities to other communities about the resources that that community has access to. So there's benefits potentially at the level of both the individual in terms of participation in the group to show that you're a, a true member of the group but also between groups, you get benefits by the groups demonstrating to other groups resources they have, tell people, trade with us, uh, share resources with us, or suffer the consequences. Therefore, the Moai represent cooperative group efforts that allowed for a good management of shared resources on the island, mitigated competition, and benefits at all scales. This requires sort of thinking about all the scales have to work here. Individual scales, where individuals are minimizing costs, getting benefits by minimizing costs of direct competition. Within group scales, where individuals benefit from group membership, essentially by investing in the group, you get benefits of being in that group, whether that's access to resources, information, or mates. Between group uh, benefits, essentially there's reduced violence between the groups because, in fact, you're signaling and allowing that information to be exchanged such that you don't have to fight each other for resources that you end up sharing by groups. And then at an island scale, as all the groups benefit from sharing and conserving resources, everyone then benefits. So, so all of these scales have to be in place in order for the system to be sustainable. The fact that it lasted for 500 years really points to the fact that this was a reasonably sustainable system. The reason the people of Rapa Nui experienced 500 years of success on a remote island is because the early Polynesian settlers were able to satisfy the three E's of sustainability by constructing Moai. The three E's include social equity, environmental needs, and economic equity. Social equity was satisfied because individuals got access to the resources they needed to survive. Environmental needs were satisfied because local resources were not being exploited by any particular group. And economic equity existed because of the redistribution and sharing of local resources. Therefore, all the pieces required for sustainable communities were being satisfied by the construction of Moai. So how can the lessons of Rapa Nui be applied to modern day society? The answer may lie in between group competition between neighboring communities that influence society in a positive way, such as organizing food drives in primary and secondary schools to see which class can raise the most goods for those in need. What other examples of competitive and cooperative activities can you think of that may help bring communities together? Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to know more about the lecture given by Dr. Carl Lippo from Binghamton University, then click the link in this video. Bye!